My name is Whitney Hill, founder and director of Spork, and I am the moderator for today's interview. I would just like to go around and have everyone introduce themselves. Um, we can start with Phyllis. Yes, I'm Phyllis Hill, Whitney's mother. Philip Hamilton. I am Whitney's grandfather, and I, I suppose I'm the oldest one in the group. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Daryl Hamilton. Uh, I'm a cardiologist and a pastor in the Montgomery, Alabama area, and I'm Whitney's cousin. You know, the first big question that's been kind of, I've been thinking about quite a bit. Um, this is a family that has many, many generations, um, many family members. You have different type of speech disinfluencies from stuttering to everything, I feel like, kind of beyond that. And um, I think that's actually uh, one of the most uh, more unique features about our family. Um, and with everything that's going around now with how not only non-apparent differences and disabilities are being looked at and recognized, but also of how that um, intersectionality affect um, or might intercross with people who are in the black or, you know, minority communities. Um, there's just more awareness. And so I, I just want to, again, thank everyone for being here. Um, so my first question that I have, um, what were some of the biggest challenges? And this is open to everybody. Um, what were some of the biggest challenges that um, you experienced growing up with having speech disinfluency? Well, the biggest uh, challenge that I have uh, ha have had in growing up was when I left Love Mike uh, School. Love Mike was a, a community school, or a, a grades one through six. And so I, nobody questioned my stuttering there. But so I left a low mic and went to high school, Alabama State Laboratory High School. I mean, I mean, everybody are are accepting me, um, but everybody laughed at I mean, at my stuttering. Uh, I couldn't open my mouth in the classroom because the class would turn out, and everybody gave me a gave me a special name. Our, 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 that name, I was Hover Hover. And so me, our, our, and that name stayed with me all the way through high school. And even 20 years, uh, 25 years after I left high school, I saw a fellow about a thousand miles away from Montgomery. Uh, and he said, I don't know what your name is, but I know that for you in high school, I am what I call you Hubba Hubba. Mm. Uh, but the point is, you, uh, you, uh, you learn to uh, live with these type of things. Um, I was always accepted. Uh, I mean, the kids always accepted me. I, 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 I was a part of whatever they were doing. Uh, but uh, that was just a part of life. I would say that um, uh, my, my first experience started in the third grade. Uh, uh, the first two years of school, I went to uh, our community school, Hamber Road, and then a uh, court ordered um, a busing started and that would have been in 1973, and I was going to, um, then I was on to a new school called Pender Street, and it was there in the third grade that, uh, that the fact that I was different or had a problem really came to light because uh, in, in the third grade, but especially the fourth grade, uh, then, you know, the teachers would have was reading out loud, and I was then around kids who did not necessarily know me, um, and uh, so I got teased a lot uh, and to the point that I really hated to participate in, in any kind of 
public reading. And one of my teachers in the fourth grade loved to have us go around the room and read. And reading had never been a problem. I could read, but uh, getting the words out, you know, was very challenging, and especially under that under the stress of the pressure of everybody looking and and listening. And so, to me, that was my most traumatic experience, the fourth grade, but it started in the third, but the fourth grade year was my worst year. Uh, beyond that, you know, I, I adjusted, um, and, uh, but uh, those are the years that I remember the most, third and, and fourth grade. Well, and I guess for me, it probably started second grade, kindergarten to first grade. I don't really have a memory other than I think I was pulled out for speech therapy. Um, but we went to a different school in second grade because because we moved. And I just know I had a very hard time. When, whenever the teacher would call us to read out loud, everyone before I even started would just start cracking up. And if I raised my hand to answer a question, oftentimes I could tell a teacher would look at me and then she'll look away at someone else and choose them instead. Um, and I always knew that was because of the stuttering. Um, and the kids would just tease you. Um, and back in the day, you know, you just learn how to just suck it up. And then, or you be, learn how to become self-deprecating, where you just think of, you know, reasons to laugh at yourself so you don't take it. So you kind of pretend that you don't take it personally, even though you are taking it personally on the inside. So I used to carry a book with me all the time because at recess, you know, when the kids were choosing, you know, the kids to play with and stuff, it was just easier to just take a book and go and pretend I'm just into this book that I'm reading, you know. And so then you have, so then you're characterized as not only being a stutterer, but you're also characterized as being kind of odd because you're always reading this book, you know, or, you know, and that, and that would carry on when you go on field trips, you know. It's like, I, only, I had like maybe two close friends. If they weren't going on a field trip, my um, bus partner was going to be my teacher because the other kids, they were just, you know, they were just, um, they, were, they, they weren't not, they weren't nice. But if I had that book, I was okay because I would just pretend I'm reading my book and that way, you know, I'd, they wouldn't see down the inside my feelings were hurt. So, but you just kind of learn over the years to just, you just suck it up and you just move on. And um, you just kind of do, kind of live in your own world and in and, and, and a lot of ways, just live in your own imaginary world where, you're like the star, no matter what anyone else was, you know, no, no, no matter what anyone else thought about you. It's kind of interesting hearing everybody's story because I feel like my childhood is bits and pieces of everyone's experience here. Um, most of my hardest memories was, or my, my, my first memory that how I was communicating just really wasn't landing on the ears of other people. Um, so that, that first memory was when I was in um, pre-K and my teacher was teaching me how to read and I already had like some learning um, differences. So that was just kind of coupled. And I remember she had to go in the hallway and have like a special um, reading session with me. And then I remember distinctly that was a story about firefighters trying to, with a red truck, trying to put out a fire and I couldn't get the sentence out and I remember looking up at her and seeing her roll her eyes and just heavily sighing and, it, and feeling such like a burden um, she did not want to be there and she did not have the patience for me and then um, and just like with with what Daryl said I, I think some of my hardest memories in school were actually in um, between third and fourth grade um, with the speech therapy. My speech therapist was not the most responsive. Um, at the time, she also had a very, very thick uh, Southern accent, which actually affected some of the lessons. Um, my biggest, uh, uh, I didn't really have too much of a stuttering issue as much of like I, I couldn't pr pronunciate CHs and Rs and it would all just come out as a garbly gook. And like everyone said, you know, the kids were um, 
kids are not nice. Kids are pretty cruel. And then adults sometimes take cues off of their children. And sometimes, you know, I think in general, we live in a society where um, if people can't understand you on the first go, they just immediately denounce your intelligence or what you're able to say. Um, and they ignore the fact that you actually do have a voice. And I think that's one of the biggest shared commonalities I've seen between non-apparent differences in disabilities, like speech disinfluencies, and those who are actually in the deaf community, because there's this commonality of, for a lot of the society of, you're having difficulty communicating, and they really do kind of put you in a similar box of, you must not have anything worth saying, and then they ignore you. Um, and I'm curious, um, from each of y'all's experiences, especially so early on, um, how do you think that affected you um, in positive or negative way as you got older going through school? I, I, well, I had no uh, speech therapy uh, um, to, at all until I had uh, finished college <clears throat> because uh, when I got to college, I, I said, I'm going to stay the teacher's college. The kids would smile. I, I, the adults would smile, rather, but uh, I, but it was okay then. And, and when I, f I finished college, the, the, the people did question why I was going into, to be a teacher and, and had a speech problem. Um, and I came to Chicago. And I attended the, uh, the speech clinic uh, at Northwestern uh, University. Northwestern was supposed to, to have had the best speech clinic in the country. From there, I went to uh, the uh, UFC speech clinic, uh, a, a speech uh, a clinic. Uh, 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 their approach was, all, was altogether different. From there, I went to... Uh, Hello, older, and uh, from there to a uh, private instructor uh, uh, downtown Chicago, and uh, but all of this was trying to correct the problem. Uh, but I found out that uh, no one knows why a person stuttered. I read every book that was in the public library, me in Chicago, me on Southern. I knew all of the experts, uh, Van Riper and all the others. But the point is, uh, nobody knew why a person stuttered. Uh, no one knew why that th there were periods of fluency and that periods of severe stuttering. And uh, I joined the, the, the uh, I, I, I stuttered an association, and, and for about 10 years, I tried to find out the reason. Um, I, when I took the, the teacher's exam in Chicago, the teacher's exam was about four hours long. I passed it. I took the oral exam, and, and the oral exam is usually about two, uh, about 15 minutes. I failed it four times because of, of stuttering. I, 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 the last time I passed it because the district superintendent wrote a letter. I, I, I had met him, the principal, asked him to write a letter. And he, he wrote the letter and I walked in, and me and I passed it. And I became assigned as a regular teacher. And I, I I taught school for, for, for about thirty years. Um, a, a parents would come up with their children of that stutter and put them in bed, so and asked to be placed in my room. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it's always a problem. But but it was always there. <laughs> uh, but you you learn to endure, and and I in speech therapy. Uh, they would usually say, um, they used to go back to Eisenhower, Eisenhower stuttered, 
uh, they brought out the idea that every culture in the world have a stutterers, with the exception of one, and that's the Native Americans, the Indians. Stutters are usually in the upper class, the more stutters in the upper class and the middle class than, than in the lower class. But I question that because a lot of lower class people uh, have middle class values, and that's a problem right there. And, and they would tell you things like uh, Moses, <laughs> a stutter. Well, the Bible doesn't say Moses stuttered. The Bible said Moses had a speech problem. And that but God told Moses, uh, and, which I couldn't understand. I said, now why would God not just speak and Moses heal him? And, and Moses would be healed. But God told Moses, uh, well, I'll send Aaron to talk for you. And they mentioned Eisenhower and his several of the kings. I, I, I stutter. But these are problems. And, and, for, and, and for about t 10 years after I finished high uh, uh, college, I, I tried to find out the reason, the, the source. And, 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 and one day I was at church, and, and the pastor, uh, Roman Jenkins, a uh, senior, preached a sermon about, uh, about uh, Paul. Paul, uh, I had uh, some problem. I don't know what it was. Uh, uh, some preachers said it was uh, epilepsy, and, and some said other things. But Paul asked God to heal it, and God did not. It's just like uh, Moses. I say, well, why didn't God heal Moses? Why didn't God heal Paul, one of his greatest missionaries? But he told, uh, uh, he, he, he told Paul, my grace is sufficient. And after I went over that, I stopped worrying about myself. I want to just take it back on uh, Uncle Philip's remarks. Uh, you know, my daddy stuttered, uh, although Uncle Philip stuttered uh, more severely. But, you know, living in Montgomery, uh, every uh, year, Uncle Philip and uh, the family would come home from Chicago, and uh, that was always our highlight, my highlight. And, uh, and Uncle Philip would come home, and he would be just, just stuttering, but he always acted like it never bothered him. He would come home, and he would teach Sunday school, and, and he, was, he, just, he just persevered. And it was Uncle Philip that, that really motivated me to just push through because I said, now, if this man can teach school, then certainly I can push and I can persevere and I can, I can do this. And so, and I've never told Uncle Philip that, but, you know, he was my great motivator. Uh, and, and so uh, I was able to just get beyond it, you know. Um, I don't think that you ever get to the point where it doesn't bother you. Uh, even, even when you get to be full grown and people laugh and and snook or whatever, I think that I think that 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 bothers you. I don't I don't know how it can not bother you, but you learn to just look beyond it and keep moving. Uh, one of the ways that uh, that I dealt with it uh, uh, in the classroom was just that. I made it the, my point to to just be a good student, and I didn't want to be just a good student. I wanted to be the, the top of the class, and I made it my point to be the top of the class most of the time. And so they may laugh at me about my because I couldn't talk, but they weren't going to laugh at me at my grades because my grades were, were, were going to be up there. And that was just my own coping mechanism. It was like I was in a fight. It was me against the, the world, so to speak, and I was going to show them that the fact that I couldn't read out loud or I couldn't talk and it didn't mean that I, I didn't know anything. And, uh, and now I benefit from that now because I, I'm, I was able to get my education and, and, and become a, 
age musician, but a lot of that I attribute just to the fact that I developed those good study habits because I was trying to show them something. <laughs> so the motivation may, may have been wrong, but, but it, it, it's turned out well for me. And it's, it, and it's really uh, in some ways kind of funny that you say that because in fourth grade with uh, that was a very similar uh, classroom situation that I was in. Um, when I first entered that class, uh, my teacher, like he said, it go around the class, you have to read out loud. I remember one time I read out loud and it was just crickets afterwards. No one said a thing. They went on to the next person. It was as if nothing came out of my mouth. And afterwards, students were telling me that they couldn't understand a single word that I had just said. And I felt like that kind of offended that no one said, or I don't know, that no one said anything or my teacher didn't talk to me afterwards or of or there's just no encouragement um and I, I made it like my duty similar to you to be the best student you know if there was a book report and if it was two pages I was going to turn in an eight page book report <laughs> of the thickest book I can find you know if um if there was a diorama or a project I was going to pick one of the most convoluted topics <laughs> and like really knock it out of the park and um, it, it's just really interesting because you're right, those coping mechanisms, they, they definitely stick with you as you become older. Um, and Phyllis, I'm, I'm curious, do you, do you have any? Um, uh, well, yeah. well, what I was going to mention, um, it's interesting to hear the similarities because I know when I was in school, I think I benefited from dad having taking all those different classes because now I was fortunate with, with Chicago public schools, they have pull out. So I have pull out for speech therapy starting from kindergarten all the way up through eighth grade. I was, had a pull out. Um, and I remember the, um, a couple of the speech therapists, they would have me stand in front of a mirror and just talk, just talk in front of the mirror and not think about what I have to say. Because I, I guess I had a couple of therapists that felt like the stuttering was coming from hearing your own voice and something was, you know, was getting away in between your, the thought in your brain and the coming out of your mouth. So she would just encourage me to just speak without thinking about it, just to, just to get it out. Um, so I had that, then I had daddy who was really, um, very active at, 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 at our church. So he was Sunday school superintendent. And so then I will look up and I'm a and I'm a junior Sunday school superintendent, which meant that on second and fifth Sundays, I had to leave Sunday school and I had to stand in front of that microphone and, and I had to talk. And we had at that t time, I guess it, was, it would be considered a medium sized church. But in that environment, there was never anything negative said. You know, I could, I could be stammering through, and the only thing I heard was, hey, man, go ahead, sweetie. You know, it was nothing but a lot of, um, it, it really gave you a lot of confidence because I almost felt like no one, if they heard you stuttering, no one cared. And then my father wasn't going to let me shy away from talking in public. So I found at times he would volunteer me Oh, Phyllis can do this. Phyllis will do this. Phyllis will go will go here and give the welcome in, the welcome address to some, you know, church program or whatever. So I never had a say. So all the way through high school, I never had a say. And I used to, and inside, I'd be kind of mad, like, you didn't even ask me first. But then, as an adult, I look back on it, and I realized it was a good training ground. Because... In the church, I think, in a, in especially in the black church, there is that sense of support. So I never felt like someone was, you know, like they were laughing at me. I always felt like there was that sense of support. So I think I took that confidence back into the classroom. And over time, my speech smoothed out, I think, because a combination of all the speech therapy I used to get a combination of daddy forcing me to always talk at church, always being in a role of leadership at church where he just didn't let me just sit on the pew. 
you know, he would make me stand in front of that microphone and give a speech, you know. Um, so I did. I, then I think that built up my confidence and watching him having confidence because daddy was always, you know, he loves to debate. If you say A, he's going to say B. And so he, and then he just didn't want you just disagreeing or just agreeing. You have to say why you were disagreeing or why you were agreeing, you know. And so I just think, so just that combination of therapy at school, having to always, you know, talk at church. And then at home, we always had discussions where he always encouraged us to give our opinion, whether it's going over the Sunday school lesson on Saturday before, before church service on Sunday, you always had to give your opinion as to why you were feeling what you felt. And so I think all of that just, just gave me a lot of confidence when it came to speaking. So when that therapist would say, stand in front of the mirror and just say what you had to say, I think I eventually got to that point where I can just stand in front of the mirror and say what I have to say without thinking about it too much, which yeah. is good when you're in school, but when you're married, it's a bad thing. <laughs> But, you know, it's interesting, you know, because those techniques and everything trickled down to how you raised my brother and I, Jesse, um, when we were kids and when we were dealing with our own speech, you know, concerns and issues. And one of the things I think is so evident and just kind of listening and talking to everyone here is when I think when you're within a family that already has some sort of whatever it is difference it could be you know a disability whatever you might want to call it there is a lot of pros with that because you're working with people who already get it you don't have to explain yourself to them or your speech that support in some families, not all families, but that support is there. And there is some generational keys and techniques and that literally do get passed down from grandpa to everyone else in the family, to his daughter, to his granddaughter. It, you know, it's a ripple effect. And I think that, um, it's amazing. There are a lot of families that enter into something like this and they're the only ones in their family dealing with it. And so they're not born into any type of um, allowance, I think, um, within their own family. And so um, I think that that's one of the big things that I, I do greatly appreciate. Um, I, growing up with a speech disinfluency, definitely had its challenges that made life incredibly difficult, but being on the other end of it definitely has been a blessing. Um, which actually has me thinking, kind of going into the next question. Um, it seems like everyone has had, and listening from one story, everyone has had um, some form of therapy or uh, speech therapy, or um, they've looked into their own speech disinfluences and come up with different coping skills and mechanisms and, and techniques. And I'm just really curious for everybody, like what are some of your personal um, techniques now as adult for when you speak to kind of help lasso in or control um, a stutter or, you know, a misspeak? Whatever the problem may be. Oh, well, I don't know if this answer the question, but uh, there is one thing that you really uh, are, are in the field of speech, a uh, very little that people can do me, me, even the experts, uh, they will tell you that uh, the first thing that they do is test the hearing. And they say that 99% of the people that can hear learn how to talk. Now, in the Hamilton family, stuttering is, is, is all the way through the family. Uh, my father stuttered, and I was told that my grandfather stuttered. And, it's, and so it's all the way through the family. Now, why? I, I don't know. I don't know of an origin in the families. A few can talk without stuttering, but 
uh, no one in me in the family <laughs> could tell, uh, could do much speaking. Uh, but the point is that um, no one knows how to deal to, to solve the problem. That that's the the, uh, the part that I, I, I thought I'm dealing with. I, I thought I've dealt with. I mean, even my grandson, a cow. A cow w was five years old, and he wasn't talking. And we took him to one, uh, put all the audiologists or a doctor after another. And we ended up over here at Christ Hospital, Children's Hospital, uh, a Christ Hospital over in uh, uh, Oak Lawn. And um, the doctor over there, but was a young uh, a fellow from the uh, I'm an Asian I, I the intern and and he started questioning me and and he wrote a, about about five pages as to why Cal wasn't talking I, well when the regular doctor came in I, he read it and he said that's a, a whole lot of BS and 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 he took the report and tore it up. He said, "No one knows why that child is not talking." And leaving the the uh, the uh, 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 the place, I passed her a car that that had a large dog in it. And when when we passed at that station wagon. Uh, that dog started barking, and Kyle stopped and started barking back at the dog. <laughs> <laughs> and then I realized then, I said, is nothing wrong with Kyle's speech. Uh, uh, Kyle is going to talk. And from that day on, uh, uh, Kyle started talking. Yeah, he did. <laughs> Kyle started talking. Uh, but the point is, uh, 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 we know very little about speech, even now. I haven't kept up with all of the research in recent years, but we know very little about speech and as to why people, some people can do this and others can't. Well, I, and I suppose it's just like anything else. Some people can sing and others can't. So that's just a part of it. Um, you know, over the years, I've tried to enhance my overall vocabulary so I can, I can substitute the words and that's generally what I do. Some days are, you know, good days, and some days are not bad. You know, and some days are bad days. On the bad days, and uh, uh, certain tasks I try not to do um, on my job. In past years, I've had to dictate, and uh, some days it's not worth the effort because uh, I could get a lot more done on a good day. And so I'll just leave those dictations to be done another day because I'm sure that the transcription just get, get fed up with, <laughs> with it. Um, and now I, now I have a person to ascribe for me since I can't really type well. So uh, that that gets around that. But if I'm doing public speaking, um, I'll, if I feel that a word is not going to come out, I'll just change the word on the spot. Uh, Sometimes I won't even, won't even write the word in. Usually I write it in, but and I hope that I can get it out. But if I can't, I'll just substitute, keep moving. And most people never knew that it didn't. It was not in the original version. Um, you know, uh, having having the speech diplomacy has made me an introvert. You know, I, I really am an introvert by by nature, and I try to avoid um, public speaking. I really have tried it. You know, uh, I'm a preacher, so you would think that I, I'm comfortable, but I, I don't think I ever get up and feel comfortable. Um, I'm always anxious, especially if it's at a um, new, uh, uh, in a new environment. I'm always anxious about it. Uh, but, uh, but because I don't stop, I just I push through it. I think that has... Um, giving me more comfort. Um, and uh, so that's kind of how I cope. Um, my son, uh, just before uh, I left the house to, to, uh, to do this segment, 
uh, he said, Dad, you know, I, I really never thought about you as being a, a stutterer. And uh, his mom said, well, because he doesn't uh, stutter nearly as bad as he used to. <laughs> but, uh, but I do, uh, but I, I cover it better. Um, my, my hardest time these days is talking on the telephone. So I really hate to talk on the telephone. I don't do that often. Uh, and I hate to go through the drive through which I do do often. <laughs> but at the drive through you know, it, it's hard, um, especially. So sometimes I'll just ask my wife to give the order or, or if a child is in the car, ask them to give the order. Um, I better not try to order sausage and biscuits. Uh, I, I just can't get it out. I said it just now, but if I have to say it at the drive through it's not going to come out. And so, you know, <laughs> so... You know, it's it's still challenging. You know, it it really is still a challenge. But uh, I've been doing it for so long now. I've, I've just uh, I've learned how to cope. And what about what about you, Phyllis? Um. Well, I guess my coping is just say what I have to say without thinking about it first. I mean, I think that has worked for me. Um, I notice when when I'm nervous or when I'm angry, anger, um, I stutter. Um, and I think it's because, it's, and, and I don't know why, I just do. So I try to just kind of just deep breathe, stay calm, kind of go over what I have to say to make my point. And then go, you know, cause, because a lot of times someone feels that if you stutter and you're trying to explain something and you're angry, sometimes they feel like you're just making it up. Like they aren't, they're, they're not taking you seriously, you know, like, the, um, and that makes me, and that on top of what I have to say, this tends to make me really angry. Um, but I just think that's, that, that's the way I've just kind of dealt with it. Um, I mentioned earlier, I always carry a book. That's always been my cover. You know, I feel like, um, you know, and I can really relate about being, a, being an introvert. There are times where, especially when I was younger, so much, uh, not so much now, but when I was younger, I would go, you, there, there, there would be something inside where I would want to go and join and participate. But I just didn't like the ridicule, so I just stayed to myself, and I just read my book. So, and I guess that there's a good, there's a, there, there's a positive from reading so many books. You just know a lot of trivia. So now I know a lot of trivia about a lot of different things. <laughs> I'm just reading these books. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that, it's funny that you say that because once again, I feel um, my own personal ba uh, story mirroring um, everyone's here. You know, I feel like um, it wasn't until I started putting this uh, interview together that I started to kind of stroll down memory lane a little bit. And I realized that there are quite a few um, techniques that I was taught as a kid that I do still use now that I'm just completely unconscious of because um, I've been using it for so long. Uh, one is um, pausing. If you have to put in like an additional pause or whatever um, to give yourself a little bit extra time to get the word out, uh, do it. Most people typically don't notice that. Um, another one, uh, I get pretty fidgety and sometimes while I'm trying to get the word out, it feels like it's getting kind of stuck. And so like I have fidget, <laughs> like a fidget uh, ring and like a fidget spinner and it allows my hands to kind of distract themselves as I'm trying to mentally get the words together. And for some reason that helps. Um, and uh, it, it's just really, and it's fascinating because I'm a huge introvert too. I think like everyone has uh, mentioned, you know, I think the fear of, or uh, in anticipation of potentially saying something to a stranger and then, and then they not, hearing it or, or not understanding or you being made fun of, that is just feels like an unnecessary pressure um, to have to deal with. 
I also feel like um, from my experience, and I'm curious to hear from everyone else, but um, being black, I think, plays a role in some of how I have to sidestep and try to publicly, you know, announce myself. Um, I feel like most of my speech therapy actually has been um, for the benefit of others. Like when I was younger and no one could understand me, my family understood me and they didn't make fun of me, you know, um, for it. But being forced to assimilate and to smooth out my speech, I felt like really was for the benefit of others so that other people could feel comfortable with uh, speaking uh, with and to me um, because my parents and my family, they put in the effort to try to communicate with me. Most people on a normal day, they, do, they really don't put in that, that same level of effort and patience. Um, and so I'm curious, um, do, you, do you guys feel like there has been some overlap with some of your experiences um, with having a speech disinfluency and your race, you know, we've all grew up in a different generation. I feel like we've each kind of seen and experienced different and similar things. And I'm, I'm wondering. I think that um, because uh, it's human nature to judge the book by the cover, uh, I think that as people of color, um, Sometimes we have to be more uh, intentional about letting others know that uh, that we do know, or that uh, we do have a degree of intelligence, or that we are qualified. Because uh, so sometimes I have felt that I was just judged, and if you uh, have a speech issue, then it feeds into their stereotype of you. And they, um, people often equate the speech impediment with a lack of knowledge or education or with ignorance or whatever. And so, you know, um, uh, I think that's sometimes I feel the need to say, hey, you know, I know my stuff or, you know, I, I do have knowledge. Uh, and that may just be my own insecurity, but uh, I do feel that sometimes uh, people equate the the speech problem with speech disorder with a lack of intelligence. Yeah. Uh, that's true in many cases, but um, a lot of times ch uh, children uh, don't uh, uh, don't tr uh, try to be mean, but that's just a part of children. When they laugh and make fun, anyway, that's just a part of growing up. Uh, now, I, I, I suppose we we call it bullying. I guess that's what they call it now. But uh, back in those days, it, 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 and it's still the, the the idea that no one wants to be a mean or, or unkind. But me as a child, but it's just a part of growing up, and the kids gonna laugh, and and, the, and there are things that you laugh at when. When, when, when they, uh, I have problems too. Um, if you, when you, I, I, I know it's Daryl, uh, Dr. Daryl was saying that uh, uh, substituting words, which is very a common thing that, that stutterers does, uh, that, uh, that stutterers do. Um, uh, Biden, the, the man running for president now, uh, he was a stutter, and and if you notice, quite often, quite often he uh, he substitute words. He try to get a word out, and it doesn't come out, and he use another one. Yeah, yeah, that is true, and I know this too. Like you mentioned, you're holding something so that you can. I guess it's a way of that tension, it can, it just, it disperses the tension. He always holds it, uh, an ink pen. He always has a pen or something in, in his hand. I tend to do the same thing. Like right now I have this beanbag. <laughs> so as I'm talking, <laughs> I'm like gripping the beanbag and I let it go. <laughs> so it's a, it's a way of dispersing that tension. Um, I, I do, I do feel though, 
like um, Raising Whitney, you know, here in uh, Dallas, hers, the, the, at the Montessori school that she went to, um, there was a speech therapist um, that was from East Texas. And at first I felt that her intent in terms of the therapy that she provided was well-placed. But um, I feel that, and I don't know if it was because she was black, but she started, you know, and I was a very attentive parent, so I was always up there at the school. Um, she started to, I noticed she started to skip that I, I think they call it IEP meetings, where you're supposed to sit with the parent and give the parent an update. And um, I know that she was skipping those meetings. And so I was really active on campus. And so I asked the principal, um, I, you know, I, was, I just asked, I just inquired, I said, can I look at her file? And I looked at her file and the, and the therapist had forged my signature on all of these IEP forms. And I said, so I went to her classroom teacher and I was like, is Whitney being pulled out for speech therapy? No. So apparently months had gone by, and I guess Whitney didn't mention it to me that she wasn't being pulled out because maybe she didn't like going. I don't know. <laughs> so, I, we, I, I I'm with the sessions. I was in fourth grade. I didn't know. <laughs> so we had to have a big meeting, and the My Story School was part of Dallas I. ISD, so it was a public school. So there's protocol. So we had to have our meeting. And I just remember thinking, you know, I'm sending my child to school and I'm thinking she's getting services, speech therapy services, and you're blowing it off. Like it's not really important. And I don't like, and she did not do that with all of the students. She just did that with Whitney. And I just felt like this is just so not right. So it turned into a big thing, to make a long story short. Um, but, um, and we got it resolved. We got it resolved in a way that was a win-win for Whitney. But I, you know, just, you know, I think a lot of parents, you know, it's like you have children and you really, and, and, and you know they have a difference. And especially if you have lived with that difference, you want them to be able to receive services. To, so that their life may be a little bit easier and you like, and they won't have to go through what you've had to go through. Um, it just always strikes me as to how some people, they, they just don't realize how important those services are that students receive those services because you're talking about the quality of their life. Yeah. Now, you, you spoke about services, and now you, you're speaking about a new generation. Yeah. When I went to high school, to grammar school, high school, and, and I went to high school, um, so um, a laboratory high school, a high school that was on a teacher's college campus, and nobody ever pulled me out and said, services, no. And I, as I look back and I thought about it, I said, that when I, that's, I, somebody there at the college I should have, especially a, a, a teacher's college, and me, me in those days, uh, a teacher's colleges were, had all kinds of degrees there. Uh, somebody would have pulled me out and said, well, some kind of services. But nobody did. And, and I, I, so I suppose that's because of, of a different a time, a generation. Yeah. Yeah, what, and it's important to know, which I think is, it's very interesting to hear this, um, because the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, was passed in 1989, um, and it was enacted in 1990, and because of that act, it enforced and made it uh, so that reasonable accommodations for disabilities within schools, within public um, areas, like there was some mandation behind that. 
And so when I was in school, um, I was actually the first generation to take advantage of the ADA and all the um, accommodations it allowed for me within school and with going to school. And I think it's, um, I just think it's, it's kind of shocking to hear that I'm the first generation, I'm talking to three individuals here who lived without any of those accommodations really being in, in the mind of anything, you know, of, um, and I, and it's interesting too, um, Biden was brought up and the interesting thing that really, um, about him running and with how his speech disinfluencies and his stuttering have been turned um, against him. Um, like we've said, if you have a speech impediment of any kind, people will automatically think that you're unintelligent, that you don't know what you're doing. And it's very disheartening for me that a large part of our society has heard Biden with his stuttering, knowing that he has a stutter, some people do, some people don't, and then spinning that into he's unintelligent, he has dementia. And I think that that narrative is so incredibly damning. And for that narrative to continuously play out for a major political figure uh, running for the top office and, in 2020. <laughs> yeah, and to still see that like damning language and, and that spin on intelligence. I don't really care if what party you're in. I just think that that's a shameful tactic because once again, um, some people stuttering is considered a non-apparent, you know, disability. Uh, in my mind and in my book, any disability and difference should not be made fun of and should be respected. That person should be respected. And this is a clear example of um, a figure on a daily basis getting uh, called out for having dementia because of a disability. Um, but that is not actually dementia. So I, I, oh. uh, that, that, how can you, a really uh, 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 accept the person but still make fun of them. Uh, growing up as children, regardless of, of what it, as to whether it's speech or not, I, I, me, me, I feel like in high school I was uh, really accepted, <laughs> but, but, but they made fun of me. And, I mean, all the way through. And, and, I, and even when I started teaching, uh, I think about uh, that was a boy that was the uh, they gave the class typing uh, manual typewriters, and that was a boy that was that had that um, that arm problem, and the, all the kids called him Wing. Wing was as popular in the kids as, as I mean as all as all as all the other children were, but but they still made fun of him. But he was accepted, and because I even tried to get because I because I even talked with the with the typing teacher about not even uh, about him about him not going to uh, to, to uh, typing, but he could, could take that arm and move that typewriter as well. I mean, I mean, as others, and, and for that reason, but the kids still nicknamed him Wing, and uh, but they accepted him. And so sometimes I'm trying to say because it's just a natural thing for kids to, to make fun of you, uh, to tease you uh, if you're different, but they still accept you. And I, I guess they call it bullying now. I, mean, I don't know what they call it now, but to me, I was accepted, but I was different. And there were other children that were accepted, and, but they were different too. Do you, do you think that um, children who, like you said, who who do like the who make fun and who might are labeled like the bully? Do you think that those people grow up to be empathetic adults? Um, 
because I guess my, my question is, is there is the, is there is such a thing as making fun of someone and still respecting them? I, I suppose so. I don't know. But uh, as far as children are concerned, uh, children are going to be children, and they're going to clown, but they, uh, they still accept you. But they, but they still are, uh, go through that process. And now, what you're saying is that to accept everybody, uh, to accept people with, without um, um, making me, me a distinction, I, I probably would be very difficult for, that, for the average person until they reach a certain age of maturity. I think that uh, you know, um, uh, I had I had I had friends. Uh, um, I kept my friends circle fairly small in terms of my true friends. I knew a lot of people, and people knew me. But in terms of my true friends, I kept that circle fairly small. And uh, probably in a, a second level fringe boundary, there were those who were friends who teased me. But within my inner circle, those friends did not tease me, you know. And so I think that we have friends, we have uh, we have true friends, and I think the true friends are less likely to, to tease you because they appreciate uh, that it is hurt or or. But then you have the other people that are acquaintances, that they're school buddies and whatever, or, or work associates and so forth, and they may not mean anything by it, but they'll say it when they, when they really shouldn't. So yeah. I don't know. I tend to think that a true friend won't won't make fun of you. You know, I think <laughs> a true friend or, or or that 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 inner circle friend. Um, but it's hard to limit that because otherwise, you, you know, you may only have one or two people that you could talk to uh, at school in a whole day. So you have to have other friends and some of those are going to teach you and, and they're going to mock you and that, that's just what they do. Uh, but um, I tend to think that they, people often do that because uh, they have their own insecurities and I think they feel the need to high, highlight uh, the flaw in you to feel better about themselves. And so as it has been said, it says more about them than it does about you, I think. And there are those who become at us and they continue with that same behavior. And they never outgrow it, uh, but uh, you know. <laughs> so, but for me, as an adult now, it makes me more sensitive uh, to people who have disabilities who are just different. You know, um, uh, over the course of my life, I, I think that I've tend to migrate it more in terms of friendship uh, to people who who have their own issues because I can identify with them having having an issue. Uh, and so, you know, uh, these life experiences, uh, as painful as they have been, I do think that they tend to make us better uh, and make us more, uh, more sensitive to the needs of others. Yeah, I would agree because as, as you were talking, I was thinking, like, I could see the faces of the kids who used to make fun of me, like the, from second grade to eighth. I went to school with the same kids. And I even went to school with part of those kids for high school. And I still know the first and last names of the kids who used to tease me. If someone asked me to give you a description, I can tell you what they usually wore. I can tell you what the hair looked like. I can tell you their little idiosyncrasies because it was very hurtful. Um, I, in grammar school, I had like maybe two at the most three friends that did not tease me at all. And I'm still friends with two of them now. One one has since passed, but I'm still friends with those two. And then I had my church friends who never, ever teased me. And I, there's five of them. And I still talk with them once a week. We do our girl chat on Thursday evenings. They have never teased me about my stuttering, about anything. So I do agree. I think a true friend will not um, 
they they're like us like my sisters have never teased me about stuttering i mean so a true friend they just don't go there they just don't because they because they know how hurtful and they also witness the pain you had when you were in school and you had other kids teasing you and so they care that much more about you and they're more protective of you i think um but i do think having had that experience and i think this is just the way god works is that he gave me a um he just made me more mindful of what i needed or how i needed to be with my own children and you know when they were going through school what i how i had to be there for them in that school building which wasn't now and i come to learn it just wasn't for them my kids have always made friends with other kids i, I used to call them like I used to call them butterflies because they were kids that never just, they always had something. One had juvenile diabetes, one had this, one had that, one had sickle cell. And so my kids always seem to bring those kids to me. <laughs> and so I said, okay. So it always tried to figure out like, why did God have me go through this? Did he have me go through this for, 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 for nothing? And I think it's a lot of it was, I like to think was it give me a heart so I could be open maybe to receiving others that just needed some place just to rest. Cause a lot of Whitney and Jesse's friends, they just needed some place just to momentarily rest, you know, someone that was going to listen to them. Someone's going to fill a gap cause maybe their parent or grandparent was going through something and they just needed someone to just show that they cared. So, um, so I just think that sometimes we're, we're given challenges um, that make us stand out in terms of being different and be picked on, maybe so that our hearts can be softened so that when someone else comes along that has, a, like, you know, like, like Daryl was saying, that has um, an issue that we're more empathetic, you know, we're more willing to reach out and to help. You know, that's so true. Um, and it's interesting because everything growing up with the friends that I had, you know, in high school, we used to um, affectionately call ourselves the leftovers because we never really fit into the other groups or cliques. We were the leftovers and that group you know, usually consisted of me and a bunch of other people with non-apparent differences who are just doing their own thing. And, um, and to piggyback off of what my mom, Phyllis, was saying, you know, I, I believe that God is providential. The work that I do now, every single thing that I do is for the disabled community and to try to provide that comfort and support for others who might not have it. And I think that it's just really important. A lot of people who, I think a lot, there are more people than not, um, of people out there who um, probably face some sort of um, microaggressions due to either their disability or race um, than they do with having someone in their corner telling them that they are accepted and loved for who they are. And, you know, I think it's important that we keep reminding people that. Um, it's also interesting because for me, one of the biggest aha moments I personally had um, about my own speech and how communication just really seems to work was when I started taking um, ASL, American Sign Language, uh, in college. And I realized that for the first time ever, I was able to communicate in a nonverbal way. And it felt like I was literally tackling a lot of my childhood issues with trying to get those damn words out because I was able to produce them in the air and it was still read and taken in and understood. And so, um, you know, this leads into my next question, but um, I feel like for anyone who is trying to just better communicate, 
I highly encourage people to look into ASL or look into at least some way of nonverbal expression because I feel like that will definitely help aid and just trying to get those synapses working the way that you want it, but in a different format. Um, and so my uh, question to everyone here, so the last question is, um, what words of wisdom or what, yeah, what words of wisdom would you like to impart? Anyone who's looking at this, anyone who either themselves have a stuttering, you know, issue or they have a child that's dealing with stuttering or a, dis, a speech disinfluency, what words of wisdom would you like to impart to them? Uh, I don't want it's perfect. <laughs> we all have our, uh, our uh, we all have uh, great qualities and, and some bad qualities. But there's no one perfect. I think that um, uh, each of us um, is made special mm -hmm. for a special purpose, and that uh, you know we we may be different, but it's because uh, there's a need for our difference, and there are people who need to be touched by us that uh, can be touched by others the way they can be touched by, by us. Yeah, I guess my word, <laughs> I guess my words of wisdom would be what, what, what daddy would tell me growing up when I would come home crying after being picked on. He would say, Phyllis, life isn't fair. <laughs> I said, it's not fair. He said, well, what's fair? Give me that dictionary. He challenged you to find a definition to the word fair. It's just life isn't fair. So you have to just you're going to have a way to deal with it because it's never going to get fair. And you can't let someone define your joy, your happiness. You just can't. You're just, just going to have to keep it moving. <laughs> I like that. I think my word of wisdom would be um, words can never define a person truly. And we shouldn't get so wrapped up in trying to get the words out so that they do define us. So we are perfect with words or without them. And if we can say words or if we can't say them, um, communication goes beyond just words. So, um, I, I want to thank you all again um, for taking the time and for talking to me. Um, I think that you guys shared a lot of powerful uh, insight with not only me, but with Spork and our readers and our viewers. Um, and I just, I just really appreciate that. And I also um, want to thank you again for digging up some of those not so pleasant um, memories. We went down a few uh, childhood lanes. So just thank you all for, for just everything. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank You're you welcome. for asking us, Whitney. Keep up the good works. Uh, this is Fork's interview, um, Getting the Word Out, the Mystifying, Discussing, and sorry, I'm going to start over because uh, this is actually a mouthful of a title that I chose, and it's kind of ironic because it takes me a second to get it out.